Aaron Uzi. I'm the global co-chair of the restructuring practice at Morrison and Forster. I'm here to introduce my fellow co-chair, Jim Peck, who's here to introduce Tim Coleman. So I'm the guy who's introducing the guy who's introducing the guy. And I'm having my web page bio updated to reflect that accomplishment today. A um, couple of words about uh, my co-chair, uh, Jim Peck. Uh, Jim is a former bankruptcy judge, having been a judge on the Southern District of New York, in the Southern District of New York from 2006 to 2014 before he joined Morrison and Forster. He presided over, uh, I'm sure, a case or two that you've heard of, including Lehman Brothers, which was the largest bankruptcy case in the history of the world. As the judge in Lehman Brothers, he wrote some important decisions interpreting the safe harbor provisions and their impact on qualified financial agreements. He, in fact, uh, was the co-chair of the ABI Advisory Committee on uh, the safe harbor provisions. Um, he is a frequent guest speaker and lecturer and attends many international conferences talking about international insolvency law. Uh, in fact, he just got back from Brazil yesterday or the night before, so excuse him if he's a little jet lagged. Um, in addition, um, uh, Jim is also um, a wonderful co-chair and a wonderful partner. If you've never had the opportunity to spend some time with Jim, I encourage you to seek him out during this conference and chew his ear off because he really loves that. And with that, I'll hand this over to Jim Peck. So uh, that was a really wonderful introduction, um, most of it true. Uh, Tim, could you come up? Just pick one of these seats, yeah, okay. uh, whichever one you want. How about that one? This one. Okay. Stand or sit? Uh, please sit. So um, just a, a few words. Please continue eating uh, your lunch uh, as silently as you can. Uh, I was asked uh, to do this uh, by Ed Altman. Uh, uh, an NYU Stern School of Business icon, uh, creator of the Z-Score, and winner of uh, this award uh, at last year's luncheon. He called uh, to say that he was going to be in Italy. By the way, Ed is always in some good place other than New York, it seems. And um, he said that um, he thought I'd be a good pick f to interview Tim and to provide um, some context around this award. Uh, I see that Marsha Goldstein is in the room. Um, this is a very meaningful award. Uh, it's named after Harvey R. Miller. Uh, Harvey and I became friends relatively late in life um, before his passing, largely as a consequence of are having uh, worked across the bench um, in the Lehman Brothers cases and then becoming um, friends courtesy of Ed Altman in part because we uh, guest lectured in Ed's class at the Stern School. And speaking of guest lecturers, uh, to my right is Tim Coleman who regularly contributes his time uh, to others including having spoken on several occasions in my class at Stern, which I took over from Ed a number of years ago. I'm no longer doing it, though. Um, so a few words about my background with Tim, and then I'm going to ask him some questions. Um, while he doesn't look old enough, uh, Tim and I first came to know each other in the early 1990s. It might have been 1990 or 1991 when he was working at uh, Citicorp Real Estate. Uh, we called it Cree, C-R-E. It was a client of my then law firm, Schulte, Roth, and Zabel. And um, I came to work with Tim as a client who was responsible for uh, a syndicated loan that was uh, secured by 757th Avenue, a building that was vacant and was part of the developer's optimism that Times Square actually could become something special, and eventually it did, but not during my watch or, or Tim's. Um, but what I'd like to do is simply ask Tim about that historical experience of having been at Citicorp, 
Um, we're not going to go back to his educational background, which is uh, distinguished. Um, University of California, Santa Barbara undergraduate. I believe a year as a waiter uh, at a place in Santa Barbara. Try that sometime in your career. It uh, really makes a difference. Apparently it does. Uh, and then um, USC for an MBA and following that um, a trip east from which he apparently never left, but he's still Californian at heart. Can you explain a little bit about the experience, because we're going to talk about the transition, of being a banker responsible for workouts in a bank that's really a bank. It's a commercial bank. It's not an investment bank. Well, I, I'm not so sure I can to this audience, because I'm looking at the ages. Uh, and everybody thinks of Citibank as an investment bank and Goldman as a bank. Uh, and back in the day, there was this thing called Glass-Steagall. You've read about it. People talk about how we maybe could use it again. Uh, but Citibank was a bank that you went and gave it deposits, and then we lent money. Our chairman, Walter Riston, was very aggressive about breaking down the walls, both uh, domestically, because you could only bank within your state. So Citibank, this is hard for anybody to probably imagine, could only bank in New York. Uh, and could not do any investment banking. And so I came out of that culture, which was a real lending culture, a, a credit, Elena, a real credit culture. Uh, so um, uh, it's just, it's hard to explain, but it was a different world. And you thought of the money as yours. So when you lent the money, you thought about getting it back, and the people who didn't give back to you uh, were sort of bad guys. So why'd you leave? Uh, were you kicked out? <laughs> well, there were probably some that were glad I left. Uh, no, no. Um, Art Newman, uh, who's one of the great, uh, I think, founding fathers of restructuring, uh, started a group at Blackstone. Uh, Blackstone was six years old at the time. Uh, we were the third leg of a stool of M&A, which is what the firm started as, uh, private equity, little private equity business. Uh, and restructuring. It was little. It, it, it's hard to imagine. Uh, and so I joined it uh, to work with him. I'd had many opportunities to go to Wall Street, the conversation we just had. I had turned them down. I didn't think they were right for me. And, and uh, I, I did this one because of the kind of person that uh, Art was. He's no longer with us. And you and Art knew each other before that? Uh, had, had you worked together before? Art was the head of this is, again, sort of hard to imagine today, but the Ed, uh, Art was the head of Ernst and Winnie. I think it was Ernst and Ernst, and Ernst, Ernst and Winnie, then Ernst and Young, or, or vice versa, those first two, uh, their restructuring group. And they did a lot of restructuring for banks. They did a lot of accounting work for banks. Brian Marcel, Alvarez and Marcel, was the first one to hire Art onto the creditor side of the business. Art got into the business when he had a uh, client that went into bankruptcy. And uh, Brian called him up one day and said, well, how about working for the creditors? We could use more information than we have. It was a great move for you. Um, this was 1992, I think? February 92. And you were there at Blackstone and um, helped guide its growth and development in the restructuring space until relatively recently when PJT was formed. Um, I'm aware that you had a significant achievement early in your career at Blackstone involving Macy's. What was it about that case that helped build your career? Well, uh, not to sh shatter my reputation, but I thought it would be good to work on Macy's because it was in New York and I wouldn't have to travel a lot, uh, <laughs> which <laughs> turned out to be bad. It would have been better to travel. Uh, it was, it, trust me, we were here 23 hours a day. Uh, Macy's was the first really large case that we got at Blackstone. And uh, it was a uh, big name. You know, we were new. Uh, Art had started the group about eight months before I got there. Uh, and, and it was a difficult deal uh, for many reasons, but it was a difficult deal, sort of hard to explain, but... There were some moments where the new CEO thought uh, Art had said some things, which he had not. Uh, and so as a vice president and new person at 
being on the debtor side of the business, which you know I thought I knew restructurings, but I had only done it from an owner standpoint, not from a advisor standpoint and advisor standpoint. And so uh, a huge amount of the uh, keeping of that business, it's sort of hard when you when you're in our business, in the advisory side, you have to go out and find business. And your pitch to people is, you're a deadbeat, you should hire me. Uh, and you try to dress that up a little bit, but that's the pitch, right? And many people are like, oh, I don't need to restructure, it's too soon, it's too something. Uh, once you get the business, then you get in there and you have to figure out how to help those people understand what they're facing. And the existing CEO of Macy's did not understand what he was facing. They had done a leverage buyout of, of Macy's. Uh, and just like we're all experiencing today in retail, we learned a lesson that you probably shouldn't lever a retailer. Uh, that lesson gets learned every 20 years. Uh, thank God. Uh, or people wouldn't be busy. Uh, but um, so, so I ended up uh, working on that. Uh, and and th so the second thing you do is you have to get in and help them understand what's wrong. You have to figure it out with them, but they don't always like to find out what went wrong. You don't walk into an advisory job and say, well, who's the idiot that bought this? Or who's the idiot that thought this? Uh, so you have to sort of think carefully as you ask questions uh, about um, uh, how to work with the client so that you're making the progress you need to make because I'm sure there are people in this room that are all like, where are you, where are you, where are your numbers, where are your numbers, and you know, you're know you sort of dragging people along sometimes. Not always, plenty of times you have incredible management teams. Uh, but uh, so, it, so it was a, a sort of that, and, and then you have to keep this business once you have it. So you have to sort of convince them what you need to do and keep the business, and we at, were at risk of losing that business. And it sort of fell on my young shoulders. Uh, and uh, they brought a new team in, an internal team in, who I got along with very well. They lived near me uh, out in Connecticut. And so every day we got up, we got in their car, we drove into work. I worked with them the entire day. We went to dinner. We went home like 11, 12 o'clock at night. And we got right back up and did the same thing every day. So it would have been better to travel. I would have had my own hotel room. I could have, <laughs> could have uh, you know, I don't know, done something else. But anyway, it was a very interesting transaction. It ended up getting, it ended up getting sold to Federated. Uh, so as we were doing the turnaround, Federated, it was worse, got out of bankruptcy sooner, and then came back and put the pressure on uh, Macy's to buy it. So you're describing an incredibly intense period as a as a young banker, transitioning from being more of a traditional workout banker at a at a commercial bank. Let's roll the tape forward a little bit. Um, you've become um, I don't want to overstate it an icon for uh, the industry. Old. Okay. Um, well, Eric, you're not, you shouldn't be laughing. Everybody okay. else can laugh. Okay, but 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 you have, in some respects, and uh, you also are very generous with your time. Those of us who attend um, charitable events in our field, like Tina's Wish, see you regularly trying to squeeze money out of uh, restructuring professionals, and and very successfully. successfully. So, but 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 from the perspective of being. Now we've we've started you out as a young banker. Now you're an experienced banker, and also somebody who's demonstrated a willingness to give back. I have a couple of questions for you that stem from time when you spoke in my class, because we talked uh, with students at NYU about how valuation, uh, which is contested can be presented in a manner that is persuasive to the finder of fact, that would be the judge. How do you do that? When you know that there is somebody on the other side who's going to be disagreeing with you. And I'm gonna ask you now, how do you maintain your credibility when you're taking an extreme position? I, I don't think I've ever taken a, an extreme position. <laughs> okay. That's the laugh line for the afternoon. <laughs> uh, I would say this. Um, I, I think at, at Blackstone slash PJT, um, we take a very strong view about the importance of the company's business plan. 
um, you know, I can get on the witness stand in front of you and argue with some other advisor in here, whether it's a 10 multiple or a 14% discount rate or something like that. Interesting, boring, uh, everybody has comps. What really matters is when you look at the business and the business plan and you try to figure out what will that company look like in year one, two, three, four, and five. We typically do five-year uh, forecasts. And if I'm taking it 10 multiple, pull, m 10 multiple times $500 million or a 10 multiple times $5 billion, depending on what the business forecast looks like, if it's credible, that makes a, bless you, makes a very big difference as to the value of that company. So I think if you get the business plan right, and that's what I was saying earlier about really working with the management team to figure out what is it, what do you have, how much liquidity you have, how long can you last, how do you finance your business, but more importantly, when this mess goes away, whatever the mess is, what will your business look like going forward? If you get that right, and you get everybody on board for thinking about the business before you get into valuation, hopefully, when you get to valuation, if everybody has their view up both sides of that business forecast, but not far off of it, then when you take your multiple, you're not far off from a valuation standpoint. And I think the number of times I've testified, actually testified to valuation, are certainly no more than five, and, and probably even less than that, just because I think if you get it right, you shouldn't have that battle. But isn't the business plan to some extent just a projection that includes a lot of fudge factors, high case, mid case, low case, um, with a lot of judgments being made. I know it's management that does it, but what role does the the financial advisor have in in tweaking the numbers to get them right? Well, we work at the base of it. If there's a if there's a crisis manager, we're working with them also. But we work from the get go with the management team, and we're pretty good at asking questions of management teams to try to ferret out what they really think. My favorite question, you can all use this, maybe you already have, my favorite question when we see the first, for every every company I've ever been to, oh no, we have a forecast. And it's always a one-year budget, not always, but almost always a one-year budget, not a five-year forecast. And they show us the forecast, and then you say, well, all right, well, what are the chances that you're going to make this forecast? 100%, we're gonna make the forecast. I'm like, well, that's great. What are the chances you're gonna beat the forecast? Oh, there's no way. There's no way we'll beat that forecast. So I'm like, 100% chance you're gonna make it and 100% chance you're not gonna make one penny more than this. Okay, maybe we better go back to the drawing board. It's questions like that that help people start to think it through. I will say we start doing our own business plans at Blackstone. Tony James made us do it. And for a bunch of people that spend their lives talking to management teams about five-year forecasts, you would have thought we hit them over the head with a sledgehammer. I couldn't possibly predict what's going to happen next year of our own people. So it's sort of, you know, a little bit of uh, what's good for the goose. Uh, but but if you, it, that, you have to just dive in and, and try to get to the base of what that business does, what it can do, what it should be doing. Uh, and if, and, and uh, it's not easy. Uh, and it takes a team effort and uh, hopefully you have a good management team that you can do that with, uh, but uh, that, that to me is uh, an enormous part of the job. When you uh, think about your career trajectory, and we're doing that today, it's pretty remarkable that you started out in 1992 essentially not knowing anything about what you've become truly expert in. What are the characteristics, your personal characteristics, that you think led to what everybody would recognize as a remarkable success in our field? Probably fear and panic. Uh, you want me to exp expand on that? <laughs> Please discuss. <laughs> um, you know, working in Macy's, I... I didn't think I knew what I was doing. I was worried about it. And I, you, you're always, I think, striving to do better. How much better can I do? And have, have I done enough? And have I thought about this enough? And have I, you know, handled the client enough? And have I worked with the lawyers enough? And have I worked with the creditors enough? And it's, you know, to me, uh, there's a certain amount of insecurity that helps 
uh, I think, build a career. Uh, if you think you have it, if somebody in this room thinks you have it all, you shouldn't be listening to me. You should get up and continue to have it all. Uh, but I doubt there is anybody in this room that feels that way because you're constantly thinking to yourself, you know, I can remember one deal I was on. Uh, I got to think about how to say this. It was Adelphia. And uh, I felt Adelphia was going to go to a 363 sale. Uh, and somebody went into art, even though it was my deal, somebody went into art who didn't, they thought he might know more than me. And they went in and they told him, no, 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 it's going to be, uh, you know, according to a plan. And sure enough, it be and I was like, oh, I must be wrong. Uh, well, it became a 363 sale. And so some of those events, I think, help you realize that maybe your thinking is good, maybe your advice is good, but I actually think fear and panic and, and a little bit of insecurity helps you strive harder always to be better at what you're doing uh, and, and uh, sort of leaving no stone unturned. Mentoring in our field is something that I know used to happen. I had the experience of um, being mentored by the late David Sykes, who was a, a partner at Dwayne Morris in Philadelphia. Um, and after Dave passed away, I remember thinking about myself, well, what would Dave do? Is there, when I had a tough situation to confront, do you ever think of yourself in the same way saying what would art do? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, I think that not just art. I think a lot of people, I don't know if you plan to mention it or not, you mentioned Marsha Goldstein. My very first deal as a banker in restructuring, 1982, was with Marsha and a guy named Harvey Miller. Marsha had a broken leg, uh, and we were working in San Diego. Uh, and every time we got up to get off the plane, Harvey, who had like a hat box with him, marched off the plane, and there was Marsha with her litigator's bag and everything else. But the consequence of that assignment is we all got to know each other well. Uh, we came home on how many red eyes, uh, back in the good old days when it was a 747, uh, had a little bar upstairs. Uh, and Harvey would sit there and, and harangue me about don't get married until you're 30. He got married at 21, by the way. Uh, it'll ruin your career. I'm like, well, your career seems to be going pretty well. Uh, I got married at 29 and a half, by the way. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, so I think people like Harvey, uh, Leonard Rosen, Art Newman, uh, Tony James at Blackstone, Steve Schwarzman, there are a lot of people, but I also think there's a mentorship that goes the other way. Uh, Eric Lisher's here, our, our chief, our COO, what does that stand for? Uh, uh, at PJT in the restructuring space. And I, I get as much that direction from people uh, of ideas and thinking as I do from people uh, above you. So I, I think I would call it networking and, and mentoring sort of in the same breath. Um, but it was people like that that really, I think, helped drive my career. I knew Harvey um, personally um, in the last uh, decade of his life better than I knew him earlier. Um, but you're about to receive an award. It's right here next to us um, that bears his name. Oh. And I just thought that was a prop. <laughs> no, it's a, no, that's, that's, I just uh, see my name on there now. Yeah, your name is there, yeah, okay, and, and Harvey's name is there as good, well. I guess I get to keep it. Uh, no, that's yours. Um, we're, uh, I don't want you to be in suspense for too long, but in about 10 minutes, you're going to get that. Okay, good. But it, ha it, it bears Harvey's name, and mm -hmm. Harvey, um, I think, without question, was um, the single most dominant figure in the restructuring space during our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And it's a little humbling, perhaps, to get the Harvey Miller Award. So here's a question for you. Why do you think you deserve it? <laughs> uh, I, th I think they ran out of names. <laughs> uh, I think one of the, what I thought where you're going with this, but one of the interesting things is when you have these other people around, and you know, wa uh, Leonard Rosen was walked to Lipton Rosen and Cats, in case you don't know who that is. Obviously, you know who Harvey is. Lots of these names, uh, Art Newman, they're all gone. Uh, and when you call me an icon earlier, which I always find humorous, uh, those are the icons in my mind. Uh, those are the people who, you know, were just such spectacular uh, people and, and, and professionals and everything else. So um, 
I would say every time I've been honored by anything, I'm always, again, the little bit of fear and panic, like, okay, I don't know if I deserve this. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm nobody's Harvey Miller. Uh, but uh, I would say that um, getting the award for somebody that had a very major impact on my career from in restructuring from 82 until uh, the point he uh, passed on uh, is a huge honor. Uh, and, uh, yeah. It, it, um, it is, and I'm going to transition away from, from this to something more recent. You have a beard. What's that about? Was that because this is a beard group event? How many people, how many people here have a beard? Raise your hand if you have a beard. All right, look, see, that's why I have a beard. Okay, so, the, so you're here, to, you're, you're emulating the other beards I'm in the I'm trying room. to look younger. I just, uh, he's hassling me. I just sailed across the Atlantic uh, and grew my first and only beard of my life. And then when I got home, I thought, well, maybe I'll keep it for a while. So I, I'm trying to look young and hip, and I think it's working. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be funny. <laughs> no, I, I think it's working too. Um, w one last point before I give you the... Uh, award which is truly well deserved. Um, I understand that while on board this 68-foot uh, catamaran that um, sailed from uh, the Canary Islands to Antigua, mm -hmm. you were in the middle of nowhere and you were doing some more reading than you would normally do and you read a book called Leadership. What did you learn from that and what can we learn from what you learned? Anybody know that book in the audience? Raise your hand if you've heard about it. No? So it's Doris uh, Goodwin Kearns. Kearns Goodwin, sorry. Uh, she wrote a book on leadership. It's got four presidents, uh, Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson, and uh, FDR, and how they approached their lives, their leadership, when they thought about leadership, uh, sometimes uh, how they made decisions sort of the same thing. Every one of them had grand failures and how they pulled themselves up from that failure. It's a fascinating book for all of you that when you're thinking about your own lives, your own career, whatever you're leading, because everybody leads something. Uh, you know, uh, I learned a lot from it. I, I, some of it was just uh, made me feel, okay, I did a lot of that. That feels good. Some of it was like, wow, that's just amazing. I mean, what they, I mean obviously what they faced, you know, facing a civil war is a little bit different than facing a Macy's bankruptcy. Uh, not much, actually, but uh, but I learned um, I learned how important it is to have integrity in your leadership, uh, to stick to your guns, and I don't mean don't be flexible, uh, but to you know don't be afraid to stand up and and be counted, uh, and, and uh, even if it's unpopular, um, and uh, how to how so many, my, my own view of leadership is listening to the people that work with you and, and, and are junior to you uh, because they have so many ideas and, and too often people ignore those ideas. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, it, it just, I can't, I can't encapsulate the book in one quick response, but I would tell you all to read it. it it's worth it. She's a great writer, great historian, uh, respected by, you know, everybody. And, uh, and uh, it was, it was uh, interesting, a uh, very interesting read. I'm not going to ask you any more about the trip, but it must have been frightening to be in the middle of nowhere reading about presidents. It felt like my uh, career. Uh, so um, you were talking about standing up. I think it's probably best for us to stand up. Uh, not quite yet. Um, my fear is I'm going to drop this. Let's just leave it. Let's just leave it no, right No, I there. think I have to give it to oh. you. I think I have to give it to All right, you. All right, wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read what it says. It says, Beard Group presents Timothy R. Coleman, um, the Harvey R. Miller Outstanding Achievement Award for Service to the Restructuring Industry, 2019. It's engraved. It's, it's, it's mine. Well, it's yours, and it's well-deserved. Congratulations, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Hold on. You gotta shake your hand. Thanks very much. It was really good. Are we done? We're done, I think. Okay. Can I leave this here to anybody that knows anything? Where I can, I can leave it right there because there's no way. I don't want to break it. <laughs>